Hi, this is Scott Kilo Sierra 6 Delta Alpha Yankee, and for today's video, this is one that a lot of people have been asking me to take a look at. So I finally got around to it, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Redivus RA-89. Now, because this is a Redivus radio, I first need to throw my Redivus disclaimer out there and tell you that I did not receive this radio from Redivus. I don't do any kind of business with Redivus. I don't take radios from them for review. If you know, you know. Um, so this radio was purchased by us with our own funds off of Amazon. So you're receiving a completely objective, um, independent review. I've, I've entered into no agreement to deliver a positive review for a free radio. Uh, so there, um, I hate to have to do that, but you kind of have to with Redivus radios, otherwise your credibility suffers. Uh, the engineers of Redivus do a pretty good job at what they're doing, but their marketing department, oh my goodness, what a bunch of dingbats. Um, but that's that. So let's go ahead and get to the review. And what do we have here? So the Redivus R80, RA89 is a dual band analog HT. It's a 200 channel radio. It's a ham radio and it comes locked into the ham frequencies when you purchase it, although it's easily unlockable uh, via keypad control. Uh, if I remember, I'll go ahead and talk about how to do that uh, towards the end of the, uh, the actual review. But it is, uh, again, dual band analog. It is uh, 2 meter, 70 centimeter. Its transmit range, as it comes locked from the factory, is 144 to 148 megahertz for 2 meter VHF. 420 to 450 megahertz for uh, 70 centimeter UHF. Now receive, it'll do 136 to 174 in the VHF range. 400 to 480 megahertz in the UHF range. It'll also receive FM broadcast transmissions, um, uh, typical you know car radio kind of stuff. If you want to listen to news radio or uh, turn on some tunes while you're on the trail, you can do that as well. Uh, this radio has a number of interesting features that make it kind of attractive for, for a lower cost radio. Now it does have some uh, a couple of things that it's missing, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we go through the review. But this does have a couple of interesting party pieces. Now the first is, this radio, um, if, if you watched any of my reviews, you know that I'm, I'm very, very interested in the IP rating of any radio that I review. I, I only tend to use radios that are IP rated for weather protection. And I like that IP rating to be something submersible. So IP67 is what I tend to use most because if you can submerge the radio in water, it'll survive some serious, serious rain. But there's some radios that I'll compromise on and go with maybe, you know, an IP66 rating, for instance, where it's, you know, half inch water nozzles directly at the at the radio. But a lot of radios that, that come in uh, from the import market, if they have any IP rating at all, or just IP54, which is very light rain. And uh, you hear about a lot of those radios getting killed in rainstorms. But this one, is not IP54, it's not IP66, and it's not even IP67. This radio is IP68, which is interesting. First low-cost import Chinese radio I've ever seen with an IP68 rating. Now, IP67 is a radio that's rated to um, so that you can submerge it to a depth of one meter for 30 minutes and have no water intrusion. So it has to pass that test. So that's one meter, 30 minutes. IP68 takes it one little half notch further and they go 1.5 meters. So a meter and a half for 30 minutes. Although in their, in their literature on the Redivus website, they call it completely wrong. While in the paragraph, they actually say it's 1.5 meters for 30 minutes. They have an image where they show um, one meter for one hour, uh, which I don't think is IP68. Somebody took some liberties there, but suffice it to say the actual rating is 1.5 meter for 30 minutes. There you go. I'm sure someone will come in and correct me and say, but it's also that too. Uh, okay, if it is, it is. Um, but I wish they would have mentioned it both at least in the narrative portion of the paragraph, but enough of that. Another interesting party piece that this radio has is they claim a 10 watt output power. Now I will tell you, I'll flash all the way to the end, I won't give you the numbers just yet, but this thing definitely does 10 watts and then some, depending on where you're at uh, on the bands. So it uh, it definitely meets that. So you've got a, 
a radio and and another thing I'll, I'll I usually mention this later, but this this is a fairly rugged radio. It's it uh, it feels solid and substantial. It's a big old chunky beast. Um, so it looks like it'll take a, a fairly decent beating, although it does have no mill standard A10 uh, G rating or anything like that. Um, but you've got a fairly rugged radio that's got a really good level of, of weather protection and 10 watt output. So as a trail radio, this thing has a lot going for it. Now, the next thing we get to is the price. And this is what I would call, I guess, a, a mid-level import Chinese radio. It's not a $28 you know, UV5R, uh, but it's also not a hundred dollar radio either. The retail on this radio is $69.99. Um, now it's currently on sale today um, on the link that I'm going to put in the description for $55.99, which is not half bad. It's a little bit more than some of your entry level stuff, but um, you get what you pay for in that respect. Now, as far as some of the things that are missing from this radio, like I said, we'll get to that when we get to the menu thing. And it's just a, it's a couple of minor little things. They're not that gigantic in the greater scheme of things, but I wish they would have I wish they would have incorporated incorporated a couple of extra things in there. Um, so that's kind of the general description of the radio. So at this point, let's go ahead and do the thing I normally do and kind of work around the radio. And we'll start where we always start, and that's the on-off volume control knob, which here you just turn it, and that turns the radio on, and you can turn the volume up and down. Now, in terms of the volume, because this is an IP68 radio, there's a big old membrane covering the speaker. And it kind of shows on this radio. The, the audio is plenty loud, but it's just ever so slightly muffled. It's not horrible, but it's not terrific either. How about that? It's adequate to task and gets the job done, but um, it's not as clear as, as some of the radios are, but that's going to be down to that membrane. Uh, and the same on transmit as well. The transmit is not as, as clear and precise as I would like, but it gets the message traffic out there just fine, and I'm, I'm not too worried about that. But again, that's down to that protective membrane that's covering the actual microphone port as well. And the microphone port on this, let's see if we can find it here. Let me take a look here. You know, yeah, I'm going to say it's probably buried behind the actual grill because there is no little normally there's going to be a hole here sometimes centered sometimes here but uh, no I do not see it so I'm going to I'm going to suggest it's probably behind the actual speaker grill um, but on transmit like I said ever so slight muffling but it's not too too terrible now moving across the top of the radio Getting back to the, uh, the travel around the radio, we've got a status indicator LED. We have the obligatory flashlight at the top of the radio, which uh, some people find them useful. I tend to disable it because anything that has the ability to suddenly turn a light on uh, coming out of the top of my pouch, I'm not a big fan of that. So I usually disable that, but some people like to use them. So there. Um, moving to the antenna, uh, first... This is something I'm going to tell you right away. If you buy one of these radios or, or if you own one of these radios, you're going to need to get yourself another antenna. This antenna is not terrific. Now, it is the same antenna that is used on the TYT series of radios, specifically the MDUV 380 and 390. Um, it's, as you can tell from the shape of the antenna, it's pretty much the, the same animal. And this isn't a very good antenna either. I have some experience with that. And I experienced the same thing here in that the reception on this radio was not terrific. And it cleared up immediately when I replaced the antenna. Now, there's still a couple of little tiny issues with the receive capability on this. Um, in comparison to other radios, the the signal clarity was better with the other radios. I was still hearing the same traffic, but the quality of the signal was not as good. It's got a little bit of hiss, a little bit of crackle on the signal coming in, whereas on other radios it was crystal clear. So that's going to be down to a combination of the receiver as well as the antenna. But I will say it cleared up even that much more when I replaced the antenna. Now what to replace the antenna with? Um, I normally do this in a separate video. But because this antenna is a little different than what you're normally used to seeing, um, I'm going to give an antenna recommendation now. So the first thing you're going to notice is a bit of a difference in terms of the antenna, because it, rather than have the center conductor pin on the radio itself, and I'll bring out the uh, TID-TDH8 as an example. 
So your typical import Chinese radio comes with the SMA mail connection on the radio side. So what that means is this little center conductor pin on the radio itself, if that pin gets damaged, the radio is out of action. You're going to need to get another radio or send us back for repair. Whereas if that delicate center conductor pin gets, um, gets banged up on the antenna itself, all you have to do is just simply replace the antenna. And I generally carry spare antennas in my go bags anyway. So this particular particular setup is my preferred setup. So let's move this aside real quick. And what we have here is the center conductor pin on the antenna and the female connection on the radio side. And so what that means is you're not going to be able to use your antennas that you might have from previous Baofeng purchases and whatnot. So you're going to have to get yourself something you typically have to if you had a, a Yaesu or an ICOM or something like that. Uh, but that's not a bad thing because that allows you to now go ahead and use the Diamond SRH77CA which for my money is the best whip antenna uh, in my experience that I've ever messed with. Uh, I love this antenna. It's, it, it'll, no matter what radio you put it on, you're going to see some kind of improvement in the signal quality coming in. So you can then put one of these on there. Now, you're going to notice if you do that there's going to be a little bit of a gap at the top. And in fact, you've sort of got an area here where water could potentially puddle up. Now, I'm not too worried about the IP rating on this because I don't see any point of intrusion into the radio. This looks like it's uh, this whole assembly is fairly watertight. But I don't want water pooling up in there and then, you know, seeping up uh, through the threads into the actual uh, antenna connection. So... I'm going to show you something that uh, I've used as a resource on other radios, like the Yaesu FT60. And where I got these was, I went down to Harbor Freight, item number 67552, the Ceiling Washer Assortment. In there, you're going to find a little receptacle, and I'm down to uh, just the, oh, actually, I've got two. I've got another one over here. So in this little uh, this little compartment here, they've got these little rubber rings which work perfect for this antenna on radio. So what you do is you just fit that over the base of the antenna, then you thread the antenna on, then you thread it all the way down, and then after that you just push the washer down, and what it does is it fills that gap, it's going to prevent water from pooling up on there, it's also going to seal the antenna to keep any water from intruding underneath the antenna up into the uh, actual antenna connection. So pretty nice little setup and it uh, it also improves the looks a little bit if that's you know that aesthetic thing kind of bothers you. Now if you don't like whip antennas and not everybody does, Diamond also has an alternative to the SRH77CA and that is the SRH701 Alpha, which is a more conventional length antenna. Both of these, of course, are dual band uh, VHF UHF antennas that will be resonant within the spectrum you need them to be. So this is just an abbreviated version of that antenna. And I happen to like this one quite a lot. And you just do the exact same thing. Just put that little gasket on there. Oh. There we go. Just thread it down, and now you can have a shorter antenna. And I can tell you the reception, well, not as good as the whip because uh, you're, you're compromising via length. Um, this is still a very effective antenna, which I like a lot. So that's it for the antennas. But as I said, you're going to need to replace that. And there are, of course, other brands available, too. Nagoya does make antennas that have SMA uh, mail connections. So if that's your brand, you can go with that, uh, as well as others. So now moving to the side of the radio. We have a PTT, which is not hinged at any point. So anywhere that you press on this, you're going to get activity off of it. We have two programmable side keys. I have this one set up for on side key one at the top, short press, starts and stops, scan. Doesn't do anything else beyond that. But you can program it for a long press to do something else, maybe turn the light on or, or what have you. The side key two, I have this set up so that on a long press, I get money. So, and boy, this thing's this thing is nice and loud. I actually vibrated my hand a little bit there, but uh, yeah, here, let me do that. 
<laughs> like I said, it's plenty loud, but the audio, uh, voice audio, uh, is going to be just ever so slightly, like I said, just ever so slightly muffled. Now that brings us to the front of the, uh, the radio itself. And here we have uh, another departure that's kind of a kind of a blast from the past. We have an old school monochrome LCD display. Uh, it's not a colored display, but as I talked about in another video recently, I'm sort of finding myself liking this a little bit more than some of the dark background displays. Um, there are a couple out there that are pretty good, but uh, I kind of sort of just like this. The ones I really like are the amber displays. Um, and I, I don't think the industry is going to go back in that direction. I just think this is what they happen to go with on this one. Um, and maybe in the future they may upgrade it to a more fancy display. But the fancy displays, it's I think that's an aesthetic thing more than anything else. But this is a very basic display. And we have, um, we have a dual dual watch capability on here. We have two lines of information here. We have two bands that we can monitor. Now you can set this up one way or the other. You can set it up so that uh, your active band is the only band that you hear and it's defined as active by the arrow and you can toggle that up and down by pressing the A, B key. So that moves that arrow down. Now the lower uh, band is the one that would be active for transmission. And then we can go back up to the top again. Um, and you can have the setup so the only thing you're going to hear is whatever is coming in on the active band and it'll ignore everything on the inactive band. Or you can set it up for dual watch where you can hear both bands, any traffic coming in, whichever one gets there first. And this can be useful, for instance, if you're monitoring or, or rather scanning on the top line. So we'll go ahead and start scan. And we can leave the bottom stationary, so if any priority traffic comes through on that band, I can hear it, and in the meantime, it's scanning through the top here. And the scan rate, as you saw, was not terribly fast, but about standard for most import Chinese radios. Now, the uh, up-down arrow keys here, this gives you your channel navigation. Uh, there is no top channel control knob, and that's also your menu navigation. Now, to get into menu, it's the green F key, and if you need to exit, just hit the A, B key. But going back to the menu, it just shows menu, and from there, all you do is just start hitting the arrow keys. Now, this is a very limited menu. You have pretty much everything you need within this menu to um, save a frequency set as a memory channel. You can even name the channel. One thing that is missing, though, and this is pretty conspicuous, and I don't know why they they left this out, but you do not have the capability in the menu anywhere to skip a channel that has been assigned to scan. So when you set your radio up via computer or however, you can, well actually you would have to do it via computer, otherwise I think by default they would all be added to scan. Um, but if you have something that's set up uh, for, uh, to be in the scan, uh, the scan menu, if at any point you need to put that on ignore, so there will be times you'll have, and, and this is a 200 channel radio, so there's no banks or anything to break it up into smaller groups. Uh, so as you're scanning through, if there's a there's a frequency that somebody's tying up with a lot of nonsense or, or you know, uh, and, and I run across this if I have, for instance, GMRS channels that are programmed in for monitoring. Uh, or actual use in the case on this radio. Uh, sometimes you'll get kids that are playing around in the interstitial channels. It used to be FRS. And if you're trying to scan, it can really get annoying. So it's nice to be able to go to the menu and just put that on skip. You can come back and fix it later. On this radio, you can't. You either have to delete the channel entirely, or you just have to take it off a of scan or just put up with it. And that's kind of a glaring omission that they... Um, they left out so you know, not much you can do about that but it is the one thing about this radio that I kind of that I kind of really don't like the rest of it though I, I kind of do so there you go uh, but the menu is again fairly typical if you're familiar with the Baofeng this should be no problem for you at all um, all the rest of the stuff you need is in, is here in terms of the keys uh, some of the keys are dual function some not um, getting back to that unlock sequence, by the way, if you wanted to unlock this radio for purposes of scan, all you simply do is hold down the side key 2, which is the one at the bottom, hold down the 9 key, and turn the radio on. That's it. That's all there is to it. 
It's all you have to do. And once you've done that, go ahead and take it to VFO and test it. And you're good to go. Now, getting into VFO, let's see here. Oh, yeah. So, radio button all the way at the bottom. Short press takes you into VFO. Another short press takes you back to memory. So, there you go. Okay, now let's go to the actual, uh, the other side of the radio. Let's look at the speaker mic port. The, um, again, because this is IP68, this speaker mic, mic port cover has a pretty aggressive gasket on here. Sometimes this pops right off and, and oh, did it that time. First couple of times I did it or tried to do it, I had to take the screw completely out and actually pry the thing off. If you, if you do have one that's stuck on there pretty good, this thing hinges at the top. So there's a little tab here that fits there. So if you're prying, you want to pry on the bottom side to uh, actually pop that cover off. When we get in here, we've got um, a typical K1 speaker mic connection. So that's going to be the 3.5 and 2.5 millimeter plugs that are normally associated with things like Beofang and, and Redivish uses it on some of the radios. But if you have that two pin plug set, um, it's typically going to be a K1 plug and that's a Kenwood type plug. But as I say, it's pretty common to the import Chinese market. Now, one little addition here, um, and I believe I mentioned it earlier, but I'll mention it one more time. Once you take this cover off and plug a speaker mic in, your IP68 rating is out the door. It is no longer IP68 rated. It may be very rain resistant, but it's no, no longer submersible. But I did notice, and I'll have to do some follow-up on this, but I did notice that they have a speaker mic that has the threaded connections on it. So what that does is there's two threaded nuts, or, or bolts rather, um, that work with these receptacles here and here. And it is it appears to be gasketed, but again, I, I can't confirm that just yet. And that may actually allow you to achieve or, or retain your IP68 rating because it'll probably feature the same aggressive gasket that this has right along here. And if it's threaded, then it's not going to work its way out. So I will have to look into that, and that'll be something I'll have to do for a follow-up video. But if you have um, K1 speaker mics, they will work just fine on this. Programming cables. They sent a programming cable with this that did not work um, for me. Now, I use Windows 11, and I tried to get get the radio to connect to my computer, and it just wouldn't do it. I went ahead and used the uh, the Ocean Magic Red cable, and it worked just fine. And I'm going to think, I'm going to suppose that it's down to the uh, the chip that's actually in the, uh, the programming cable itself. If you get a programming cable with yours, I don't know if it's going to work or not, to be honest with you. Um, but you can't go wrong with that red. And I, let me grab one real quick. And this is what I'm talking about right here. They call it the Magic Red Cable. It's an Ocean product. Uh, it says support Win 10 on it. Uh, it works with Windows 11 also. I have not found a single radio that this cable doesn't work on. And that's, like I say, the K1 type connection. Um, this works on everything. And I kick myself in the ass for not buying one of these years and years and years ago. But if you have a lot of these Chinese radios and you're looking for a programming cable that will work on all of them, that's the one to go for right there. And I'll, I'll try to throw a link in the description on that one as well. Now, moving to the back of the radio, we've got a belt clip that's actually secured to the body of the radio, although it does look like it's on the battery. It actually attaches to the body. Um, got a stake pin. Not going to work its way out. Good solid clip. Uh, no complaints there. Now we get to the battery latch. This one has an interesting battery latch on it. And this is actually something it's taken from, I, I mentioned earlier, it uses the same antenna as the TOIT radios, the uh, MDUV 380 and 390. Well, they also have the same battery latches too. A little bit different shape here, but it's it's the same all the way down to the USB-C covers are the same. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But to uh, unlatch these, it's a little open in an arrow. What you do is you simply press it down. Simple as that. Same thing here. So to pop the battery latch, you just press that. And the latch opens up, then you can very easily take the battery out. It's a good rugged latch, and battery latches are something that some radio companies don't pay the degree of attention they need 
too. Um, I've seen a number of radios that have, in fact, I have an Alinko radio that I used to think pretty highly of that um, the battery itself swole up and the battery latch popped and broke and it literally self-destructed itself. Um, but let's take a look at this battery real quick. It is a 2500 milliamp hour battery. Good long life on this. It's a good, thick, beefy battery. Um, no complaints there. And battery life has been very good on this radio. I've used it quite a bit uh, leading up to this actual review. And I can report, like I said, that um, it, it gives you good, honest battery life. And the recharge cycle is fairly short. This did come with a cradle charger, but it does have the capability to USB-C charge. See a little charge indicator there. And a, a defect that it shares with the uh, the the TYT radio is your your cover is not captive so this little tiny rubber piece is all that's plugging this up and if you want to retain an IP68 rating you need to keep that sealed up this is a bit of a problem they should have put some kind of tab that retains it but they didn't so there you go and that is super duper easy to lose so I suggest if you're messing around with this and you're going to do some charging, really pay attention. Don't just flick this thing with your fingernail because chances are it's going to fly across your campsite and you'll never see it again. So there. Um, charge time in USB-C was, was perfectly adequate. No complaints there at all. It didn't take excessively long at all. Looking at the actual compartment on the radio, we have our FCC sticker. We have good gas getting around the battery connection there. And then to uh, seat the battery, you just there's a tab here and a tab here. Just lock those in, press down slightly, close the latch, and that is it. Good to go. So that's the run around the radio. Let me go ahead and talk about testing, performance, that kind of thing. As I alluded to already, um, audio, uh, incoming audio, like I said, is plenty loud, ever so slightly muffled. Transmit, sort of the same thing. You're readable, but there's a little bit of muff to it, and that is all the way down to the membrane that's covering up the, uh, the speaker and the microphone itself. Now, the opening for the microphone, and this is the first time I've run into this on, on one of these radios, is I don't know where it's at. I mean, there's normally a little bitty hole right there, Sometimes it might be right here. I've seen it sometimes in the center. I don't see anywhere on the front of this radio where the actual microphone is. Now, that is something you might want to know. So let me consult the manual. Now, this manual is garbage. It, this is maybe the worst manual I've run into in quite a long time. You've got, let's see, oh, there we go. Well, that is helpful. At least there was a little bit of a description there. So it says the microphone is right there. So I'm going to guess it's tucked behind the speaker grill here. And it's about where most of them are. Now, why is this important? Why is it important to know where your microphone port is? Because if you hold your radio like this, I'm actually covering my microphone port with my hand. So I made it a habit long ago to always hold my radio so that the entire front of the radio is unobstructed. But it is a habit. I see people do some of the weirdest stuff. I've seen people hold radios like this, which is interesting, a real interesting approach, um, completely lacking in understanding of what comes out of this little thing right here. Um, you're going to mess with your signal a good deal by holding it like that, but that's usually a person who's not a radio person. But uh, you, you definitely want to be cognizant of wherever your microphone opening is so you don't cover it up. So there. Um, so back to testing real quick. Let's go over the, uh, the results. Tiny SA testing, like I say, I don't do these things live anymore. They eat up a heck of a lot of time, and then I just end up arguing with people over my testing methodology. But uh, I can assure you I know what I'm doing when it comes to that. And Tiny SA, it did pass uh, spurious emissions. It did throw some spurs, but they were within standards, just barely, but within standards, which is normally what I expect from one of these types of radios. Now, my big thing was going to be the, uh, was the output testing, because remember, they claim 10 watts. And a lot of times, when a radio company will claim 10 watts, you'll actually only get maybe 8 at best. Um, and a lot of people will, will comfort themselves by saying, well, 8's better than 5, so that's something, right? Yeah, but it's not the 10 that they promised. 
but I'm usually skeptical whenever they claim 10. So I ran this on my MFJ digital watt meter. I also uh, cross verified the results with my analog watt meter and got the same results. So here's what I got for output power testing. There's three power levels on this radio. High is 10 watts, medium or mid is 5 watts, and then low power is 1 watt. <coughs> Excuse me. On high, 146.420 to test VHF. My output was 10.45 watts. All right, we exceeded 10. I then went to 441, so 441 megahertz for UHF to test that. I got 11 watts. On 446, I got 10.3. So it looks like a real sweet spot there, right in the low part of uh, the UHF band. But that is definitely more than 10. Now, I have, I mention this every time I talk about a 10 watt radio, and I'll do it again this time in case you haven't heard it. Sometimes when you, when you talk to people in, in the ham radio world, they can be very, their explanations can be mysterious and often um, based on stuff they heard from somebody else. So people will say, and you will hear people say at some point or another, 10 watt radio really doesn't give you that much of an advantage. It's not that big of an improvement, so it's really not that important. Well, no. Um, so typically, uh, your typical HT is going to be 5 watts of output. If you have a, uh, if you have a radio that will do 10 watts, that's a 100% improvement in output wattage. Okay, Where people get con confused as they think the questioner being asked is this. Is 10 watts twice as powerful as 5? Well, it is in terms of pure mathematics. Um, 10 watts is double what 5 watts is. But in terms of actual performance, that's not the case. The radio is not twice as powerful as a 5 watt radio. We're talking a, a difference in, in terminology. Or we're talking decibels. So it's not the improvement you think it is, but it is an improvement. A 10 watt radio legitimately has more output power than a 5 watt radio. It is not twice as much in terms of performance. You don't get twice the distance. It's, it's not that, but it might be the decisive advantage you need to hit a distant repeater or a distant simplex station. And it's undeniable that you're going you're gonna to hit a repeater harder at 10 watts than you are at 5. It's not, you're not going to hit it twice as hard, but you are going to hit it harder. So that 10 watts can actually be kind of an important thing. But I will, I will temper that by saying this. The price you pay for 10 watt output is you're going to eat up your battery a lot faster than you think you're going to. It's going to generate a lot of heat on the radio, and it's going to put wear and tear on the radio that you otherwise might not need to do. You can get by on 5 watts pretty effectively all day long. I would run this thing on mid-power, but if I needed some extra punch, you can kick it up to 10 watts. That'll give you a little bit of extra leg room, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be run at that level all the time. Make sense? So that's kind of a cool thing here. So in a nutshell, to sum it up, we've got a radio that's fairly low cost. It's, you know, just a bit above 50 bucks, between 50 and $60. It's a, a fairly well-made radio. It works as advertised. You've got the availability for a higher output rating than a lot of other HTs have. You've got that excellent IP68 weather rating. It's a solid, substantial radio, although this doesn't have a mill standard 810 golf rating, so it's not shock rated and, and rated for pressure and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't feel flimsy. How about that? This doesn't look like something that's going to die the first time you drop it. Uh, so as a trail radio, as a backpacking radio, as a radio for things you do when you go out and practice being cold, wet, tired, and hungry, this is not a bad little radio. Not, not bad at all. Now, what's going to be interesting is to see how it compares against its 
closest competitor, something like the TID Radio TDH8, and that will be fodder for another video altogether because I think I'm I'm getting I've collected enough of these 200 channel radios that are kind of mid level pricing that it might bear kind of a head to head comparison between a few of them to see which is the best of the best or at least show you the alternatives out there. But this is one I can definitely throw into the recommendation mix. For people that you know maybe don't have a heck of a lot of money to spend on something um, a, a little more pricey, but still get some of the advantages of those pricey radios, particularly in terms of that weather protection rating. So with that, I will bring it to a close, but I'll mention one last thing real quick. Um, as you probably know, Spectre Gear is my day job. We manufacture as slings and pouches and all kinds of stuff for the the tactical market but some of the products we make that are particularly um, useful to you guys as we manufacture radio pouches both molly and belt mounted and of course we make radio pouches for, the, for this radio so just throwing it out there uh, i don't do that often enough but it is my day job and it is what keeps the lights on around here and if the business is uh, is doing well i'm doing well if i'm doing well i'm happy and if i'm happy i'm doing videos so how about that so if you get a chance stop by see if there's anything you can do to support the company but with that i will now bring it to a close thank you for watching and are listening this is scott kilo sierra six delta alpha yankee from visalia california have a wonderful day